Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fifth lecture in MEC 3430, Automotive Engineering Fundamentals. So we're now going to leave internal combustion engines behind and focus on other systems in uh, modern automobiles. So in this lecture, we're going to look at clutches and manual transmissions. So last class, we looked at spark ignition and compression ignition combustion, at least from an introductory standpoint. We looked at some of the important processes, how the mixture is prepped, and also chamber design. Now in this class, we're going to look at the need for transmissions. We're going to look at what a clutch is and why it's needed. And we're going to look at what goes into the design of a manual gearbox. So what's the purpose of a transmission? Well, there is need for a range of gear ratios, or ratio between the rotation speed of the crankshaft of the engine and the wheels. So the desire to keep the engine optimal, either efficiency, max power, et cetera, operating range, as vehicle changes speed. So gearboxes allow for changes in the ratio between the crankshaft rotational speed and wheel rotational speed. So we looked at here force versus speed. We looked at what gear you're in. This is the resistive force, in other words, the force trying to slow the vehicle down. When we're in first gear, we can get a lot of force, but we can't go very fast. Second gear, we have less force, but we can go faster, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So at some point where the resistive force mass matches the driving force and we can't go any faster or we can't accelerate anymore. So in other words, a gearbox is allowing for an optimal trade-off between the amount of force and between the maximum speed that we can go based on the maximum engine RPM. So there are two types of transmissions. There are manual and automatics and there are two functions every transmission has to perform. Decoupling, so that's decoupling between the engine spinning and the wheel spinning and gear changes. These are two things that must occur. So what is the purpose of a clutch? So clutches are used in manual transmissions generally, or at least when we refer to clutches, we're generally referring to those being used in manual transmissions. So there has to be a way to allow for gear changes. So if the drive, if the crankshaft was always solidly connected to the drive shaft, we wouldn't be able to change gears because there's a force, or there's a lot of force on those gears being held together. So clutches act as a couple between one rotating shaft to another rotating shaft. So basic functions are couple the crankshaft to the input of the transmission. It has to be capable of transmitting the maximum engine torque. It has to be in smooth engagement and has to allow for rapid disengagement and re-engagement. So generally when the clutch is together, you're driving the vehicle. When you're going to change gears, you have to disengage the clutch so that you can change gears so the driven member is no longer spinning. You also have to do this when you come to a stop. If you try to stop a vehicle with a manual gearbox without disengaging the clutch, you're going to stall the engine. If the clutch is engaged, the crankshaft of the engine has to spin at the same speed as your wheels. If your wheels aren't spinning, the engine can't spin, therefore it stalls. So type of clutches used between engine and transmission are generally called friction clutches, i.e. they work by, they transmit the torque between the two rotating shafts by friction created between two disc surfaces. So here are some fundamentals of clutches and how they work. So there's a, they vary the pressure that holds the disc together, changes the slip rate between the and driven. So force is gonna be equal to pressure times area. And the amount of torque that can be transferred is referred to as frictional torque, or torque equals friction times the average radius. So we're going to look at different designs. So there's different designs. There's two-piece clutches and three-piece clutches. We have here where we have the driving shaft, so coming off the crank. We have the disc from the crank shaft and also from the drive shaft, and they are held together sandwiched by a spring. We also have a three component clutch, where basically we have a flywheel, which is connected to a diaphragm, and there's also a, another connection between the clutch plate and the transmission. In this case, the basically the pressure plate sandwiches the clutch plate to the flywheel. So it's a three component. We have the flywheel, the pressure plate, and the clutch plate. So the way this operates is the pressure plate sandwiches the clutch plate into the flywheel, and that is how we transmit 
the power from the crankshaft to the transmission shaft. And generally, in steady state or when there's no input, the clutch will be engaged. You have to use a you have to have user input to disengage the clutch. So almost all manual transmissions on vehicles, the clutch is engaged unless you put some other input, which is generally putting your foot on the clutch lever or the clutch pedal. So here we have a throw out bearing which allows the pressure plate to be pulled back and for the clutch plate to disengage from the flywheel. So what are some desired features of clutches? So we want the force to separate the plates must not be excessive. You have to do this with your foot. There should be a reasonable coefficient of friction so that we don't have to have gigantically large clutches. The rubbing surfaces must be hard enough to resist wear, but not so hard to become scored. You must have adequate surface area and mass to absorb heat. We need adequate ventilation and cooling. We need adequate thermal conductivity to avoid the heat and avoid distortion. And finally, we need a friction material that will not crush at high temperature and clamping that's not clamping, clamping loads. So here's a blow up of a clutch assembly. Um, I will let you go through this um, as you see fit, but we can look at all the details of a three component clutch. Now, I said for clutch activation, generally the clutch is engaged unless there is user input. Essentially what we have here is we have this throw out bearing which is pushing on the pressure plate. Now, when you have the throw out fork, eventually this what this basically does is it pushes the throw out bearing forward which pivots the pressure plate and throws it backwards which allows the clutch to disengage from the flywheel. Now there is also a return spring which basically forces this to under steady state stay engaged. Now there's different ways to actually operate the clutch. Remember as a user in your car you have to have some way of actually actuating this clutch. Generally it's done with a clutch pedal and this is connected to the throw up bearing through different methods. Uh, one way to do it is a rod linkage, so we use solid rods to connect the clutch pedal which is in the cabin which the driver will actuate and we use solid rod linkages to connect it to the throw up bearing. Now there's two ways to, to do this, so we can either have um, what would be more atypical would be a hand lever or more common would be a foot pedal to actuate it. Um, it's possible to have either arrangement, although foot pedal is much more common. Now, generally, you only use rod linkages when you, for uh, say maintenance free or longevity of the design. Rod linkages are very robust and they generally don't need any, uh, to, uh, how shall we say, maintenance throughout their life. The other option is a cable linkage. You have a foot pedal and the foot pedal is connected to the throw out bearing via a cable. This is cheaper to do except over time this cable will stretch and you need to adjust the cable. So there is some maintenance with the cable linkage, although it is much cheaper. And then there's the hydraulic system. Now remember one of the criteria for a clutch is that it doesn't require a lot of effort to actuate. Well, if you have a very big heavy clutch, as maybe you have in a big diesel engine with a very large uh, flywheel system, therefore a big clutch, you might actually need the assistance of hydraulic pressure to actuate the throw out bearing. So in this case you would use a hydraulic system where basically your force on the clutch pedal is multiplied by the hydraulic system to actuate the throw out bearing. So hydraulic system is definitely for more heavy duty applications such as very large diesel transport. So in other words, not used typically in automotive design. Okay, so that's the clutch which does the decoupling function. Now what about the actual changing gears? So in a basic gearbox, the definition of a gear train is that two or more gear wheels linked together in series. So a simple gear train is when two gear wheels are mounted on separate shafts in the same plane. So a gear train is a single stage if only two gears are utilized. So basically we have two gears connected here, an input shaft and an output drive. So if we look at a very simple 
image here, if we look at 3.4, we have an input and we have an output and they're connected by some gears with some differing amount of teeth to create a gear ratio. So this is a simple gear box with only one gear ratio or what you would call is one speed in this case. There's only one ratio between the input and the output. We call that a speed. So this would be called, or you can also call it a gearbox with one gear. Now, that's kind of misleading. You call this a gearbox with one gear, but there's clearly two gears meshed. So you have to be careful with the terminology. Generally, when people somewhat slang or how should I say informally describe a transmission, they'll say it has six gears. Well, that's not true at all. It actually has more than six gears. What they mean is it has six ratios between the input and the output. It's important to get that terminology straight. And so when you hear someone say six gears, you know they don't literally mean there's only six gears. They mean that there are six ratios between the input and the output, or six speeds, you could say. OK, then there's a compound or multi-stage gear train. This is what is actually used in manual transmissions. And you see here, we have an input shaft which then connects through a gear connection to a intermediate shaft, which then connects to an output shaft. So in other words, this is a one speed transmission, or if people were using slang informally, they'd call it a one gear transmission, even though there is four gears in the actual physical makeup. It's important to keep that um, in mind. Now this is if we want the input direction of rotation to match the output direction. But if we want to have a reverse, well, we can go in reverse by having an idler gear in between the input and output. We have an idler between the input and output. We can actually have a reverse where the input is spinning one way, and the output will spin the other way. So we actually have a reverse gear. Oops. Now, I should also mention at this point, from your machine dynamics course, you should be comfortable with calculating the ratio of velocity and or angular velocity and torque to the input and output given the number of teeth. From the number of teeth, you can calculate the um, rotational velocity ratios and therefore you can figure out the torque ratios. This should be from your machine design course. If you're not familiar with how to do this, um, either brush up on your machine design course or come see me during office hours or send me an email. You should be able to calculate the input and output velocity and torque ratios. Okay, so what type of gears do we tend to use? We said in the manual gearbox. So there's two types. There are straight tooth spur gears. So teeth cut at right angles to the face of the gear and parallel axis to the gear wheel. Um, there's a rolling motion at the pinch point, then a sliding motion, so this is noisy, and there's no axial thrust generated. Uh, helical two spur gear, well, teeth are cut at an angle to the angle to the gear face and axis, so there's a constant contact of gear teeth as rotation occurs. This is less noisy, but there's axial thrust generated, so we need more bearings to hold these type of gears in place. Now, helical two spur gears, that's what are actually used in manual transmission gearboxes. Now, I showed on that previous slide a gearbox with a single speed. Even though there was four gears in the actual gearbox, um, there was actually only one possible speed. So we haven't even talked about how we can have multiple speeds. Well, the way that happens is meshing different pairs of gears. So here is a diagram of a four-speed gearbox with a sliding mesh. So in other words, the gears have to mesh and unmesh to create different gears. So we look at first gear, we go input shaft to the um, intermediate shaft, and then we have a meshing between the intermediate shaft and the output shaft. In second gear, we change which gears are in mesh between the intermediate and output shaft. Third gear, again, we change again which gears are in mesh between the intermediate and output and for fourth gear, there is a direct coupling between the input and the output shaft. We can also have the reverse gear, which utilizes those idler gear concept to change the rotation of the output relative to the input. So when we have multiple speeds, or what people would say multiple gears um, in a transmission, it's all about sliding and meshing different gears with each other. <clears throat> 
Now, the problem with sliding gears or um, meshing gears back and forth is it's actually very difficult to get gears to mesh because the rotational speeds have to line up and also the teeth have to be in the correct orientation. So almost all, well, actually all modern vehicles use what's called a constant mesh gearbox with synchronization. In this case, it's not the gears meshing that is changed, it's which gear pair that is locked to the output shaft that changes. So these gears are always in mesh. These pairs are always meshed. The difference is which pair gets locked to the output shaft and therefore controls the ratio of the input to the output rotational speed. Now that's probably sounded pretty confusing. So at the end of this lecture, we're going to have a video which is going to explain the whole concept of constant meshing versus sliding meshing gearboxes. I think it's easier to understand it through a video rather than explanation. So how do we, so how do the actual linkages look between um, the user or the driver and selecting the different gears? Well, very common gear link, linkage setup is shown here. It's basically we have what's called a rod and fork gear selector arrangement. Basically there are three rods and these rods will allow you to select either first or second, third or fourth, neutral or reverse. And more rods if you have um, additional gears. So if you have a six speed, you might have four rods instead of three. And essentially these rods have forks that slide back and forth that slide what are called the synchros in and out to lock the different gear meshings to the output shaft. Again, this will make sense when we look at the next or look at the video coming up. So this video, uh, I'm not going to watch it in this recorded lecture. Uh, the video will be posted on Blackboard in the same folder as this lecture video, and you can watch it um, at your own convenience. OK, so that is all I wanted to do for this lecture. Uh, remember, there's a midterm next week during our somewhat regular lecture time. Um, so study tips, lecture notes, including everything that I've said. There's previous quizzes, um, which will be posted on Blackboard. Um, the textbook, I would say, is a last resort. I'm not going to test you on anything that I haven't said or isn't in the lecture notes. However, if you want a different way of explaining something that I've said in the class, your textbook can be a good aid. Now, because of COVID-19, um, the type of tests that I can give has to be different than before. Previous in this type of course, I would have given a test that really more heavily focuses on memorization of the concepts, being able to label part components, being able to uh, give different firing order diagrams. Um, that's not going to be relevant because it's an open book test. You're going to have all the information in front of you. So yes, while the test will partially require um, some form of memorization, uh, it's mostly going to focus on application of the knowledge. So you have to have a more understanding of design choices. So those slides where I talk about pros and cons of different systems or compare different types of systems, those are going to be critically important for this test or at least for a good chunk of it in addition to the um, being able to label different engine components, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have any questions or comments about that, please come see me during my office hours. Please send me an email. I'll be happy to clarify. I once, as again, as always, take it out the door, something you learned, something that was explained that was not clear or confusing. All right, thank you very much for your attention. Next week we will have our midterm, and then we will continue on in the course with automatic transmissions. All right, thank you very much for your time. Goodbye.